Shabbat Shalom to the Mizpaka, to the family of Yah. Welcome to Daughter of Yah Teaching Ministry. Greetings in the name of Yah, the Father, who is head over all, and our Master, Yahushua HaMashiach, who is the only begotten Son of the Father. Greetings. Welcome to our two-part teaching, um, our covenant message that we're going to be presenting to you today. I am super excited to share with you um, what the Father Yah has poured into me um, regarding this message. Um, today's message is not going to be um, an extended uh, message. It'll be, I would say, about an hour and a half at the most. And so let's go ahead and get into today's message. We're going to be focusing on covenant today. And I think this is going to be very helpful um, to those of you who may be asking questions about uh, covenant relationship with the Father, with the Son, and if how we know, because being in covenant and the importance of knowing if we're in covenant has to do with how secure and fastened we are to the Mashiach, okay? And so we are the body, but we also, of those of us um, within the house, um, I want to focus on um, Isaiah 33, verse 20, okay? So Isaiah 33 and 20, let me go ahead and read it, and then I'll kind of go into explaining um, the meaning of this verse, this prophecy here. So um, it says, Behold Zion, the city of our appointed feast. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, an untroubled habitation, an immovable tent whose stakes will never be plucked up, nor will any of its cores be broken. So let's kind of unpack this scripture um we know that yah has chosen zion he has chosen jerusalem as the place where his name um dwells um it starts off with saying this is the city of our appointed feasts we know that there were specific feasts where we had to be in the land we were commanded to go in the land, to go to Jerusalem, to keep the feast, and that is going to still continue during the millennium. And so this is a happy and joyous time. This prophecy um, is kind of two-folded where um, Isaiah is being told that they're going to be delivered um, from oppression from the Assyrians. But this is also for a future tense. This is for future time um during the millennium reign of our master Yahushua. So this is going to be a happy and a joyous time where in this land um there will be no more hostile invasions. This was a promise um for this city that Jerusalem uh would be a, a place of stability um and a place where Peace will be within its walls. It will be um, a quiet habitation. It will be secure. And so I want you to think about that as we are focusing on the immovable tent that is being spoken of in Isaiah 33 and 20. It's saying that this will be an immovable tent. A tent is a house. Okay. So it's tabernacle. This tabernacle. Uh, the one that is to come, it will be immovable, 
okay? And this tabernacle will not be torn down. It will not be plucked up. So what secures anything? What secures anything? We think about the tent, okay, which is likened to the house, the tent. What secures a tent? It's a tent peg or the nail. Yahusha is the nail. He's the nail peg. It means to connect. It means to add, to join. Okay. Um, I've kind of in the 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 bob or the wa is the six Hebrew letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's the sixth letter. The, some people refer to it as the bob and others the wa. But nonetheless, it's the a picture of the nail peg. The pictograph is a picture of the nail peg, and it means to add, to, to connect, to join. And the nail peg, in order to be able to secure the tent, it, it had to be uh, deeply fastened in the ground. Okay, I want you to take a look at some things that I've added at the bottom. We know that uh, Adam, man, um, came from the earth, came from the ground. The ground, the Hebrew word for ground or earth is Adama. And man, Adam, came from Adama. He came from the ground. So Yahusha is, uh, the nail peg is some symbolic of Yahusha who connects us to all things, okay? Um, if we are uh, the ground and, and he and that nail peg is securely fastened and fixed in the ground, then that, that house, that tent is going to have the support that it needs. It's going to, um, it's not gonna blow over Okay, it's not, it, and it won't be wavering back and forth. It, that tent, uh, that house will not fall down because it is secure with that nail peg. Okay, and so when we think about, and I know we've seen this in scripture with the children of Israel as they were journeying, anytime they were journeying, once they came out of Egypt and they, the Father Yah was taking them throughout their journey. You would he, you would read a scripture as we're going to read today that they pulled up stakes. So a stake um, uh, is literally a nail peg. It's a peg. The parent root word it is spelled from right to left. Dalit tav. The dalet or dalit um, is a fourth Hebrew letter. It means the door. We know Yusha is a door. It means a in or into entry or pathway and then the top is a 22nd hebrew letter and it um uh has a it's a picture of two sticks crossed kind of like the lowercase t and uh, many refer to it in the, in the church as a cross but it's the it's it's the uh, two sticks that are crossed and um it represents the covenant the mark the sign um, salvation, all of those things. And so stake, according to the ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible, means uh, peg or nail or pen for securing something. Um, it is pronounced yathade, okay, yathade. And um, again, it means to pen as you're pinning something down to secure it, a peg, a nail, um, use the pin or to fasten. So you would use a stake or, an, or a pin or a peg, a nail to fasten something, okay? And so as we speak about the tent peg, the tent peg is, symbolic or represents commitment. When something is securely fastened, uh, when something is joined together, and, I, and remember, I want you to, uh, everything that I'm saying, I want you to keep this in context of covenant, okay? 
when something is passing in this tent peg, the tent peg represents commitment and that tent peg being fastened and being secured again it represents commitment it represents dedication um it is symbolic of obedience which is shema to hear to obey um we learned that on last shabbat to shema is not just auditory auditorily hearing but it is obedience it means to obey it, it means to, to um respond okay so it's not just i i was given a command i was told to do something i heard it but i actually responded because your ability to hear and to respond um is is pivotal um, to being secure, okay? And so it represents obedience and your willingness to submit and to follow the order of the leader of the house, the leader of the tent. Um, our strength depends on how well we're anchored to Yahusha. If you understand what I'm saying, the strength, because if we're the, the house, okay, and we're the house and the tent, that tent and the strength of that tent, the, the, the ability of that tent to be able to stand up, to be, to be, to, to sit upright, to stand upright. You you no one wants to be in the tent and the tent is wavering with the wind. Uh, there's no stability. Uh the strength of that tent, which is symbolic of the house, it depends on how well we're anchored to Yahusha, how well we have anchored ourselves to Yahusha, who is the nail pit. Okay, and it is a nail peg that fastens us securely to the ground. Okay, and so a nail or a hook secures or joins and binds one thing to another. Okay, and so a firm tent peg is anchored. It's rooted firmly in the ground. And because a tent peg that is, and let me just say this, a tent peg that is planted in weak soil or soil that is not firm, it can be easily pulled up. It can be uprooted from the tent, from the house. Let me say this again. A tent peg that is planted in weak soil soil that is not firm if you if you're trying to plant it in sand I, that's not going to be firm a tin peg that is planted in weak soil or soil that is not firm it can be easily uprooted it can be easily pulled up from the tent of the house. And so you want to make sure that the tent peg is fastened securely to make sure that that does not happen. So um, I want to read Isaiah chapter 20, verses 20 through 25. In this passage that we're getting ready to read, um, Eliakim is referred to by Yah as a tent peg that is driven into a firm place. On that day, I will summon my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and tie your sash around him. I will put your authority in his hand and he will be a father to the dwellers of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. We just got finished talking about keys to the kingdom. 
a couple of Sabbaths ago. He says, what he opens, meaning what Eliakim opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I will drive him like a tent peg into a firm place. So notice that the father, Yah, again, is referring to Eliakim as a tent peg. And he says that he is going to be driven into a firm place, not into, as I just stated earlier, you don't want to drive a tent peg or plant a tent peg in soil that is weak and soil that is not firm because then we know that this house, this tent can be easily uprooted. So he says, I'm going to drive him like a tent peg into a firm place and he will be a throne of glory for the house of his father. Something else that I want to um, make mention of that I'm thinking of as we, we did a study maybe around three years ago. We did a study on the entire book of Judges. It was a tremendous study. And if you did not check that out in any free time you get, it's worth going back and watching that entire uh, uh, series that we did. I learned so much. But in Judges chapter four and five, um, we find in these two chapters, this is, Again, following a continuous pattern, um, if you know anything about the book of Judges, you know that the children of Yashrael, there was a continuous pattern throughout the entire book where Israel had, you know, fallen into idolatry and then Yah had to discipline them. And so um, he, I remember that he sent Sisera, um, who was a uh, Canaanite general, to oppress them. And this was part of their uh, punishment because again, they the, the cycle, <laughs> you know, they had, they fall into idolatry and then he would discipline them and then they would cry out and then he would go and raise up a judge to deliver. So it was just a continuous cycle. And so Cicero, during this time where they had fallen into idolatry again, continuing with this cycle, and so he sends this Canaanite general to oppose them. And this is for 20 years. And, um, and so, you know, while they're in this continuous cycle, you know, you know, Yashrael, they will cry out for help. And then he was, he sent Deborah. So when we get to Judges chapter four, where Deborah, Deborah comes onto the scene, you know, and, um, she was judging all of, Yasharel at that time. And she, um, along with Barak, defeated Caesarea's army. He did not want to go unless she went. And she led that army, okay? Um, but Caesarea escaped. So the, this, the, this uh, Canaanite general, he had escaped on foot and he fled to a tent of this woman named J.L. Um, and, you know, she promised that this would be a sanctuary. He, he believed that this was going to be a, a sanctuary, a safe place um, for him to hide out because he was on the run. And so when Cicera went to sleep in JL's tent, she picked up, I don't know, those of you who, who um, took part in that study, I don't know if you remember that uh, JL, this woman, she picked up a hammer and she drove a tent peg, a nail through his, right through his temple. And it, it went right, and the scripture says it went right through the ground. So she secured, and, and really, and, and what I found out also is this, that the nail peg can also be a symbol of judgment as well. And so that nail peg going, being secured all the way through 
the ground, this was showing his judgment, okay? And that nail peg was used um, as judgment for uh, this Canaanite uh, general, Sisera. And when she, when she took the hammer, she drove the tent peg through his temple and it went right through the ground. So she secured it by driving it into the ground. And I don't know if any of you remember that. So Zechariah 10 and 4 says, from him, meaning Judah, from him shall come the cornerstone, from him the tip peg, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler, all of them together. And so we know that Yahushua is the found, he is the foundation he is the chief cornerstone and it says from him is coming the tent peg he is the nail okay he is the nail he is the connection um and so yahusha is a foundation he's the chief cornerstone and we know that the entire structure is literally built around this one stone and on the flip side, this same stone that can be a support and it can be an anchor to us, those who uh, want to be connected to Yahusha, okay? This same stone, this same support, this same anchor can also be a stumbling block to those who do not trust to those who do not believe in him or his testimony. And so when his righteous judgment falls upon them, it'll be likened to a massive rock that falls on them um, and they'll be crushed. It tells you that everyone who falls on this stone um, will, uh, will be broken, but anyone on whom it falls will be crushed, okay? And so I just thought that was interesting that he was being referred to not only as the cornerstone, but also the, the chief cornerstone. So let's get into our first reading. We're going to only read three um, scriptures today, and um, I'm going to end it and we're going to go to part two. So let's read Exodus chapter 33, and we're going to read... Um, begin at verse 9. Exodus 33, verse 9. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And Yah talked with Moses, and all the people saw the cloudy pillar standing at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent every man in his tent door. And Yah spoke unto Moses face to face as a man speaks unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Verse 12, And Moses said to Yah, See, thou saith unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know um, whom thou will send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou um, hast found grace in my sight. And now, therefore, I pray unto thee, if I have found grace in your sight, because Moses is saying, you, 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 you told me you want me to bring these people up, but you haven't shown me who's going to go with me. He says, if I found grace you know, grace in your sight. He says, show me now the way. He says, show me your way. Moses asked to see his way. I want to know your way. He says, so that I may know you, that I may find grace in your sight. So he is asking, I want to know your way. How many of you have ever prayed to the Father? You know, reveal to me your way as you did to Moses. Moses asked to know his way so that he may know him and that he will find grace in his sight. And he says, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, my presence shall go with you. My presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. And he said unto him, 
if thy presence does not go with me, then carry us not up then. So he said, look, if you're not going to go with us, do not, you know, let us go anywhere without you. We want to go wherever you're going. So Yah assured him that um, his presence was going to go with him. And I want you to think about that. Who do you think his presence is? Who do you think his presence? Who came from his presence? Let's go to the second one. Um, the second of the three that we're reading today, Exodus chapter 40. So we're reading Exodus chapter 40. We're going, to, we're going to begin at verse 34. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of Yah filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because a cloud abode there and the glory of Yah filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Yeshurel went onward in all their journeys. And if the cloud was not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of Yah was upon the tabernacle by day and fire was on it by night in the sight of all the house of Yasharel throughout all their journeys. So throughout all of their journeys, throughout all of their journeys, they did not move unless the cloud moved, whether it be by day or by night, they did not move. They did not move. Let me say this again. They did not move. Look at verse 37. If the cloud was not taken up, if the cloud did not move, then they did not journey. They did not move. It says, for the cloud of Yah, verse 38, was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night. And this was throughout their entire journey, okay? Throughout their entire journey. And so um, this is a picture of the children of Yasharel departing Sinai to go to the promised land. The pillar of cloud had already been mentioned previously. We've, we've already read two of the three chapters that I said we're going to read in part one. We read Exodus 33 and we, we just got finished reading Exodus 40. And so the, again, the pillar of cloud ha has already been mentioned. And by now, at this time, the cloud, as you see, the cloud is no longer just sitting in the tabernacle. The cloud is no longer remaining in the tabernacle, but this cloud is now guiding the children of Yasharel. Is this cloud is guiding them in the way? Moses prayed and asked, "I show me the way." And so this cloud is guiding the chosen people of Yah in the way. And this is occurring by a pillar of cloud by day and also a pillar of fire by night. But this was no ordinary cloud. This was no ordinary, regular cloud <laughs> that we see in the sky every day. No, Numbers 33 tells us that by the command of Yah, the children of Yasharel moved or did not move. We just got finished reading that. At the command of Yah literally means at the mouth of Yah. Remember by the word of Yah and by the breath of his mouth, the world was created. So by the command, at the command of Yah, at the breath of his mouth, the children of Yasharel, his chosen people, did not move unless he moved, okay? And so the word um, or the command came directly from the cloud. And the cloud, and we talked about this before, remember the cloud represents what? 
the very presence of Yah. And so now we are going to read Numbers chapter 9, verses 15 through 23. And on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, even the tabernacle of the testimony. And at evening, there was on the tabernacle the appearance of fire until morning. So it was always the cloud covered it and the appearance of fire by night. So this was always, this is so as it was always, the cloud covered it and the appearance of fire by night. Verse 17, and whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, then after that, the sons of Yasharel would pull up stakes and in the place where the cloud abode, okay, there the sons of Yasharel encamped, okay? Now, this is what we referred to before about picking up stakes, okay? It says, verse 18, by the mouth of Yah, or the command of Yah, the sons of Yasharel pulled up stakes, and by the mouth of Yah, or the command of Yah, they encamped, okay? All the days that the cloud remained over the tabernacle, they remained in the camp. And when the cloud tarried over the tabernacle many days, meaning laboring many days, remaining many days, it says that the sons of Yasharel kept the charge of Yah, and they did not pull up stakes. So as long as the cloud remained, the sons of Yasharel, they kept the charge. They kept the command at his mouth. They obeyed and they did not pull up stakes. They did not journey. And it says that when the cloud was over the tabernacle many days, by the mouth of Yah, they encamped. And by the mouth of Yah, they pulled up stakes. Verse 21, and so when the cloud was there from evening until morning, when the cloud was taken up in the morning, they pulled up stakes, whether by day or by night. When the cloud was taken up, then they pulled up stakes. Let me say this again. I want you to really pay attention to what's happening here. When the cloud was there from evening until morning, when the cloud was taken up in the morning, when the cloud was taken up, then they pulled up stakes. They journeyed, they moved, and whether it be by day or by night. And then when the cloud was taken up, when the cloud moved, then they pulled up stakes. They journeyed. Verse 22, whether two days, whether it be a month or days, it says whenever. When the cloud tarried over the tabernacle to remain over it, then the sons of Yeshua remained in the camp. So they did not move unless the cloud moved. And it did not pull up stakes unless the cloud pulled up. And when it was lifted up, they pulled up stakes. Verse 23, it says, by the mouth of Yah, they encamped. And by the mouth of Yah, they pulled up stakes. They kept the charge of Yah by the mouth of Yah and by the hand of Moses. And so this is a picture of Yasharel's dependence. What we just witnessed, what we just read in Numbers uh, chapter 9, verses 15 through 23, is a picture of Yasharel's total and complete dependence and submission to the Father Yah. Um, all throughout this passage, and that's why I read it twice. This is a picture of Yasharel's total dependence on Yah and his guidance. And we 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 saw this all throughout this passage as we read. They did not move unless the cloud moved. When the cloud moved, they moved. When the when the cloud moved, they picked up stakes. When the cloud remained, they encamped. Okay, they settled down. But this shows the guidance of the Father, okay? But this was no supernatural, this was no regular cloud. This, again, was a supernatural 
presence that was with them. And who do you think this presence was that was going with them? Who came from the very bosom, from the presence of the Father? Okay. Who would go before them? This cloud going before them was an assurance that he was with them. His presence via this cloud would lead them where to go and when to go. So they didn't just get up when, and I say when they wanted to go, but they pulled up stakes when they saw the cloud leaving, okay, pulling up. And so his presence would guide them in the way. And when we read John 14 and 6, Yahushua says what? I am the way. Okay? He said, I am the way. And so the only job that Yasharel had was to follow and to obey. And two words come to mind as I was reading Numbers 9, verses 15 through 23. Follow me. Follow me. Psalms 32 and 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Throughout, as we read, because we read, you know, earlier we read in um in Exodus 33 and Exodus 40, and we've read uh, Numbers 9. And as we continue reading about this cloud that um, led them in the way, they followed. They did not pull up stakes unless the cloud pulled up. If the cloud remained, no matter if it was uh, two days, two months, they remain. And as I stated, two words came to my mind, follow me. If Yahushua is a good shepherd, should we not have that same mindset? Again, let me reread Psalms 32 and 8. It says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. I will guide you with my eye. Again, the pillar was assurance of Yah's shelter, his covering, his protection. And again, the only duty, duty that they had was to follow to follow the cloud, to follow his presence, to follow and to obey, to follow and to obey. And so something that I wanted to bring to my, to, to your attention, that the Father I brought to my attention a while ago, and I didn't know what I was going to be using it for until I was presenting this message. And this was shown to me maybe about a month ago. But Psalms 32 and 8 says, Ayah says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go, and I will guide you with my eye. If you look on the left, eye means to watch. The pictograph ion is a picture of the eye, and the nun is a picture of a sea representing continuous. Combined, these mean the eye of continuous, meaning his eyes are continuously watching over us. He's watching over us. He's keeping us. He's watching us. Continually as a shepherd watches over the sheep. The shepherd is constantly watching. An eye of continuous, continuing to watch. You, you've heard the people say, I'm the, the watchman. They will watch to make sure that there were no predators, no wolves coming in to harm the sheep, to steal the sheep. But I want you to take a look on the right-hand side. Guess what else was under 1359 for I? Look over there on the left. I is also cloud. I always wondered until today 
why he was following them in a cloud. Cloud means I. A watching over something of importance. Hallelujah. Who would have known? Did you know that when I looked up this uh, in the ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible for I, the first definition for I was tent or tent panel. That was the first definition for I was tent or tent panel. I'm thinking I, tent, didn't put those two together, but the first definition for I was a tent or a tent panel. And the second definition was to watch. And then I saw a cloud. And I said, what? I means cloud? Wow. I would have never guessed. I would and and I and cloud, this was the first. Um, this was the first definition for it, but I thought this was awesome. And that makes so much sense now as to why the cloud covered them because he was watching over them. I also means um, the eye reveals, the, it says the eye um, reveals the heart of the person. So the eye reveals the heart of the person. It, scripture tells us that if your eyes are dark, the whole body is dark. Your heart is dark. It says a well, spring, or fountain as the eye of the ground. Eye, fountain, face, presence, before. Zion, we learned earlier, was referred to as an immovable tent. One in future tents will not or no longer be pulled up, will be a place of stability, will be secure. Isaiah 33 and 20, another version reads, look at Zion. The city of our festival times, your eyes will see Jerusalem, a peaceful pasture, a tent peg that does not wander. A tent peg that does not wander. Its tent pegs will not be pulled up, nor will any of its cords be loosened. So when we are in the millennium, in the future tense forever, this will be a place of peace, a peaceful pasture. This tabernacle, its house, the tent pegs will not wander. They will not be pulled up. Hallelujah. Isaiah 54 and 2 reads, Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and drive your stakes in deep. Drive your stakes in deep. Hallelujah. He said, drive your stakes in deep. You're gonna, your tent is gonna be enlarged. Your house is gonna be enlarged. It's gonna be stretched. Your dwelling place is gonna expand. He says, lengthen your cords and then drive your stakes in deep because you are an immovable tent. Hallelujah. Yahushua said, take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He said this in Matthew chapter 11 verses 29 and 30. My yoke is easy. When he says my yoke is easy, he means kind, goodness, fit for good use, manageable, pleasurable, pleasant. 
At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Take my yoke upon you. If we are in covenant, he has told us to take his yoke. Because when it speaks of it being easy, it's literally saying gentleness. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, meaning humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Follow me. As the children of Yashorel, follow that cloud, his presence. Follow me. He told his disciples, follow me. He told them two words, follow me. Learn from me. When he came to this earth, they learned of him. They learned his ways. He says, for I am, what did he say? He says, I am gentle. I am gentle. So when we learn from him, we know that he became our wisdom from the Father, Yah. Wisdom is the fruit of gentleness, being cautious, being careful, walking circumspectly. He told us over and over, take heed, lest no man deceive you. Let no man deceive you. He warned them to be cautious. If we follow him and keep his commandments, we'll be walking circumspectly because we're being careful. We're being cautious. Learn. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn from me. So it goes back to being connected, that the covenant, being connected, firmly fixed, rooted and grounded, abiding in Yahusha, being fastened. And that can only happen if we are following him. If we are following him. But we are in a time now and we're heading to part two of today's covenant top message. Some are falling, and I'm not going to say some, many are falling away from the top. They are falling away from the covenant. The top represents the covenant. Okay. The top is the covenant, sign and mark of salvation. Yahushua says, I am the olive and I am the top. I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. So the question I want to ask you before we end part one and enter into part two of today's message is, is your tent securely fastened? Is your tent securely fastened? Check to make sure that 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 your 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 tent is is not in soil that is loose that can be easily uprooted. Is your tent your house? Is it on a firm, solid place? Some, many, I'm not, I'm not going to keep saying some, many, even in this awakening, have fallen away from the ta, from the covenant. Your tents are not secure. You're not attached. Your nail is not attached. And so my message is to consider how firmly fixed and rooted and grounded you are in him. 
if you're following him as it is written, then you will be you will be secure. You will be fastened securely to the Messiah. And so now we're going to end this. And I'm going to lead you into to part two, but I, I have this last thing that I want to share with you. This last thing here. So I was looking up some uh, information and I was looking up the secret place for a future message. And secret place means a cover. It means a hiding place, a place of protection. It means to keep close as you would keep someone close to your bosom. It means to conceal and to guard. This is what secret place means. And then I looked up secret according to the ancient Hebrew lexicon in the Bible. And I could not believe it. That secret. Listen up, guys. <laughs> secret means gentle. And it was the first definition. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Secret. The first definition for secret was gentle. It means to be tamed. It means to be tamed. The pictograph olive is an ox head and the tet is a basket as used to contain something. Combine these mean the ox contained in the sense of being tamed or gentle. The idea that one that can be rough and harsh but acts in a gentle manner. Like we know that Yah is almighty and powerful. But he is gentle because he knows that we're just flesh. We're breath. He can act rough and harsh when it needs to be, but he is gentle. And gentleness is a fruit of the spirit. This, this, this fruit of gentleness message that Sister Prina taught, this gentleness message is a gift that just keeps on giving. It seems like it has opened up so much understanding gentleness gen secret means gentle yahushua says take my yoke upon you my yoke is easy and my burdens are light he said that he is gentle and lowly our master is gentle and he is lowly he is gentle and it means secret. And secret also means to conceal and to guard, to protect, to cover. All the things that we saw with this cloud. Cloud means eye. You guard with your eyes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so I hope you enjoy part one of our tall covenant message. We're going to enter now into part two. Shalom, brothers and sisters. I had to hurry up and grab my camera. So the second time this week, because this is dissipating as um, I'm recording this, but and it's not as defined, but I am in my room and there was a very distinct that was on my wall for the second time this week. Today is Friday, February the 23rd, 2024. And this very same talk was on my wall in this very same spot, very distinct where it was basically all I could see three days ago. This was three days ago on Tuesday, the 20th. 
I believe they I believe Tuesday is the twentieth, yeah. And three days and even as we speak now, it's dissipating and it's going away. I tried to hurry up and grab the camera and it's dissipating as I'm even recording this. That's how quickly it appeared on the wall. The Hebrew letter Tav is the 22nd letter and it represents our master. It represents the covenant mark and sign. Uh, many mistake it and they call it a cross, but it is the Tav and it means um, shaped like the letter T. It means uh, covenant mark sign it represents salvation and i wanted to just share this with you like even now as i'm recording it's going away and so i was trying to share where it was coming right across from the wall here and it was going across and now it's going away now you're seeing more of my blinds um but it was this is it was very distinct where all i saw was this was this tall um on tuesday three days ago and i think no tuesday had to been the 20 uh yeah it tuesday was the was the 20th i believe but anywho three days ago i saw it and i didn't have time to get my camera and i tried to get my camera it's because it's only apparent for a moment and so now we're pretty much don't see it but I wanted to um, share this uh, with you pay attention now to some signs because there might be things that you may be um, the father yeah may be revealing to you some things even in just in your natural habitat in your natural environment I've, I've just been noticing a lot of things um that have been occurring you know in this time and um we want to make sure that we're being uh, vigilant that we're being that we're watching that in this final hour uh we're remaining set apart and um I just wanted to share uh, a quick uh, message with you, something that was laid on my heart for the body of believers in this end time. Shalom. So as you can see, um, the sign is now, um, the top sign that was on my wall is gone. I mean, as quickly as I ran to get the camera, it is almost as quickly as it dissipated. But um, nonetheless, I'm going to just go ahead and just share what was laid on my heart. Um, we are literally in the final hour. I'm not sure if many of you within the body, you know, have felt this, but I have um, been grieved in my heart, my spirit, um, just knowing, you know, I shared briefly before uh of a dream that i had on february the 7th um i was in a building um which was symbolic like of a house and although i was in the building i was able to see outside of the building and outside of the building i saw a sea and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. And it was the most terrifying thing that I've ever witnessed. I've never had a dream like this. But there was a beast that was coming out of the sea. And what was interesting is it was suddenly. It was sudden. Everyone was going about their day. As a, as a matter of fact, it looked like it was along the shore, along the, like maybe almost like a harbor type situation. People were walking. And then this beast, slowly, almost like a shark's fin that comes out of the water, slowly until it completely reveals itself. And this is what I saw. 
I saw a beast coming out of the sea and then I saw a dragon. It appeared like a dragon and I was so terrified. I remember how I felt, how terrified I was at seeing it and it came up out of the water so quickly. It was just suddenly. And what rose up in my rook, like this, this is a, a this beast has been here, waiting for the time to finally reveal itself. Because it came up slowly, but it was it was a subtle. I was to say a subtle quickness. It was like it came up suddenly, but. It came out of the water quickly. Um, and I'm trying to explain it as much. I'm visualizing it as I saw it in the dream. And I'm trying to explain it at the same time. Nonetheless, this beast, the way it appeared is it had been there waiting. And it, when it rose up out of the water and I saw a dragon, it looked like the appearance of a dragon that was coming up. Um, out of the sea and um, it began to come towards the building that I was in and it was just demolishing everything that was in this path as soon as it seemed like it got up on like it was heading towards the building and then I was awakened from the dream and this was the most terrifying dream that I've ever had and this B system um, it's been here for a while it's been here, um, but it is now. I mean, they've had a lot of these celebrities that have come out, um, and they've said, you know, we're ready to worship. They're ready to worship the bees. They're ready. And we know when these people who are of the world who do the bidding for the dragon, for the enemy, for Satan himself. We know when they're saying we're ready to worship, we can't wait. We know that they're not talking about Yah Almighty. Okay. And so it is time for us to realize that we are living in the days where it seems evil unto men to serve Yah. That's the times that we're living in. It, we're living in a time right now where we must choose and be serious and genuine about repenting of those things that you know are wrong. Many of you who are listening to my voice now know there are things that you are doing that are wrong and you have not repented. We're in those days where the scripture tells us that if it seems evil unto you to serve Yah, like we're in those days where good is being spoken of as evil and evil is being spoken of of good. We're living in the days where it seems evil unto men to serve Yah. This is how far in rebellion the world is. A dear sis did a message on the love of many are waxing cold lawlessness is abounding lawlessness is abounding because the love of many are waxing cold the love of the father yah the world is lawless they are embracing lawlessness they are embracing the beast the mindset the system and Camilla Harris is coming to Michigan and she's actually doing her tour, but she's here today for reproductive rights. Okay, they they want to, uh, I, I can't think of, I think it was in Alabama where they uh, ruled that, um, uh, that they ruled that the I think the the seed of the, the man the sperm is um, 
is a child and they are outraged because people who want to do in vitro fertilization are saying that's going to affect them if you're saying that this the sperm you know is a is an unborn child that if there, there's i think that and i might be getting it wrong but they're saying that and i'm gonna play the video at the end so that you can actually see because i'm I, I feel like i'm getting it wrong but they're basically saying that the sperm is a child okay and so everyone is upset and so again people are saying oh well this is our rights so we are living again in the days where it seems evil unto men to serve Yah, to obey Yah. And so right now in this time, so many of our brethren and even those within the body are distracted. They're spending more time on social media and more time doing things that are not of the kingdom than they are in fasting and prayer. It is time for us to labor in prayer. We have a tolerance for more of the things that are in the world. More We can labor and spend hours, two, three hours watching a movie, but we cannot sit for two or three hours laboring in prayer and fasting laboring in the time that we spend with the father in intimacy in the secret place sitting in his presence it's time to be um in the field it says the harvest is plenty but the workers are few there are few that are willing to labor in the field and I believe this is the reason why he took me away from work. Because he needs laborers, but he needs those whom he can trust to do his will. It is time for us to stop laboring in the world and laboring more after people who are walking in darkness, being consumed with. And when I look on social media, a lot of us are saying we're walking in truth but we're consumed all we post on social media is about who's doing this and who's doing that in the world and being consumed with what cat williams is doing i didn't watch it you know why because i don't care what cat williams is doing there are many believers that were caught up in that and watching the sitting down and watching the whole interview of him just basically so-called gossiping and exposing people like how is what cat williams is doing let the, the he says what you should say let the dead bury the dead let the world be consumed with what the world is consumed with that was the distraction and many of our brethren was caught up in that caught up in watching that as if that is going to edify and build up our brethren we spend so much time laboring in the world, laboring more after people who are walking in darkness, being consumed, being consumed with and chasing after and following after people who are scorners, chasing after people who are walking in darkness. We are consumed with people who are walking in darkness. That interview with Cat Williams went global and there were many of the very people of Yah that were sitting there watching it while he has a witchcraft in bloom around his neck. Many were watching as the world exposed their own. He's of the world and the world loves their own. They expose their own. Let let them deal with their own. That has nothing to do with us. Many of us, again, are consumed. They're consumed with and following after those who are walking in darkness more than they are with the light of the Messiah. 
in this day and hour, we have to determine who our master is. Many of us in this walk still do not have the fruit of self-control, do not have the fruit of gentleness. Sin should have no power over us. You who should die to set us free. So we should not be intentionally and willfully sinning on purpose. And I'm not talking about, because we're all being cleansed and going through that process of sanctification. But we should not be willfully and intentionally and knowingly sinning. This is not what those who have the seed of Yah in them do. No sin should have power over us. Sin should not be our master. David prayed, do not let sin have dominion over me, rulership over me. Who is your ruler? The world is showing who their ruler is, and they're embracing it. We have to make sure that we do not make Yah's name blaspheme before the heathen. It's not just about us having our name changed, adding Yah somewhere in your name. It's not about, okay, you have your head wrapped. You have a metre on your head or you're keeping Sabbaths and feasts. But what you profess, what you confess openly with your mouth, who you say you believe, it must align with how you live your life. When you are in Yahusha, you have power. You have power over sin. He told you in Luke 10, I give you authority to tread on snakes and on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, to overcome the power of the enemy. I'm sorry. He has given us authority to overcome the power of the enemy. We have the power to overcome him. And that is only if we are rooted, firmly fixed, and grounded, immovable in Yahusha. Again, what you profess must align with how you live your life. The fruit bears witness of who you truly are. The fruit in your life is evidence of the deeds that you have done in this body and what is in you. The fruit reveals what is in you. No good tree produces evil fruit and no evil fruit produces good tree. Remember, each seed, everything is after its own kind. Whatever is in you is going to come out. And so, the fruit that you bear, it bears witness. Many have become desensitized and have allowed the world to desensitize them to holiness and to the righteousness of Yah. And because they have been desensitized, they have allowed the world to tell them what is right, what is wrong not the scriptures now they don't even recognize the voice of the master who's calling them he says taste and see that yah is good and so how can you be certain who yah is if you do not sit in his presence if you do not read his word if you do not fast and you're not pray in prayer, how would you know who he is? How do you, when he says, taste and see that Yah is good, how, how do you know what certain foods taste like? How do you know what certain fruits taste like? Is it not because you have experienced them? Is it not because you've had certain things? I know what apples taste like. I know what grapes taste like. I know what a banana tastes like. I know what certain fruits taste like watermelon. You know why? Because I've had them numerous times.
when there are certain things that you eat, let's say your favorite fruits, like I love blueberry, blueberries and strawberries. I love watermelon with seeds, of course. And when you've had them enough, you become familiar. Your taste buds become familiar. You'll even begin to get a taste and the desire for the things that are your favorite. You'll say, mm, I got a taste for this. So anything that's your favorite, you continue to eat over and over and over again. And you become very familiar. I can tell the difference between a banana and watermelon, blueberries and strawberries. How about a food, a fruit maybe that you don't like? If someone were to blindfold you and let's say uh, you don't like pears and someone blindfolded you, but you love um, an app, maybe you love apples, but you hate pears. If someone was to blindfold you and they were to maybe peel the skin off of the pear and the, and the apple and to blindfold you, you would be able to tell the difference. You will be able to tell through tasting, through, you know, maybe even the texture, maybe through smelling the pear, smelling the apple. You will be able to tell through your senses because you've experienced them in a number of ways. You will be able to tell the difference. And so the same thing, Yah says, taste and see that Yah is good. When you have tried certain foods and you have eaten them enough you now become familiar you now know them because you've experienced them and likewise the same is with Yah and our master Yahusha the more time you spend in his presence the more time you read his word the more time you practice applying what you have read and what he has brought, the understanding that he has brought you into, the more familiar you become with him. The more you know him. The world does not know him. This is the reason why you have churches like the one you saw in Atlanta where they're playing the world's music and dancing and have blurred the line of sanctification. They have blurred the line where now Carnality is now holy. It is time for us to get our houses in order. Repent and separate yourselves from this perverse generation. Your life is everything. Shalom. So let's see what the Bible says about an embryo. Does the Bible confirm the Alabama Supreme Court's decision?
Kimse This is unprecedented. This has never happened before. Um, we now have a situation where we are saying that a fertilized egg is a child. And uh, all of the things that we do as part of the IVF cycle are called into question. Not to mention the fact that, um, what does this mean for us as a country? Are people not going to be able to get the care, medical care they need if they're suffering from infertility and you know need to build their family? in this process. Hopefully, what can happen in Alabama and possibly across the country is that people will begin to examine in a greater way IVF and its unethical practices we know that there are hundreds of thousands of embryos that are discarded through the IVF process, killed and lost. And as pro-lifers, we believe that that's an unethical treatment of, of human life. And so hopefully through this decision, people can begin to examine that and to make changes in the industry. Personally, as someone who's dealt with infertility for over a decade, that I know the pain of wanting to have a biological child and not being able to conceive. At the same time, there are ways that we can pursue that that are more ethical than others. And so, my hopes is that every person that desires to have a family and start a family would be able to do that, but to do it in a way that still honors and preserves and protects human life. I think the most important thing is to do what's right and what's ethical and pray and work towards a reality of more people recognizing that this is the right and ethical thing to do. And in this case, the right and ethical thing to do is to preserve life. And there will always be some people who do not see that reality, but that's why we work to, to share truth, to show them that abortion is an act of violence, to show them that the pre-born have value to show them that embryos have value and worth and dignity. And there will always be people who might not agree with that message, but I believe if we continue to speak it, that we will win more hearts and change more minds in time. We will not obey! We will not obey! We will not obey! Listen at them. Listen at the scorners and the scoffers. Listen at those the Bible spoke of, the love of many will wax cold. We are, as I said earlier in this video, we are in the days where it is considered evil. It is considered an evil thing to serve Yah. I want to read something that um, was in my studies uh, this morning. Today is still Friday, um, February the 23rd, and I want to read something. Um, I was reading Hebrews chapter 7, and this is speaking about the supremacy of the, uh, of the greater priesthood. Um, after the order, according to the order of Melchizedek, that order is 
of both king and priest when we know it is Yahusha. I want to read this. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and the priest of the Most High Yah. He met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham apportioned to him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother or genealogy. Okay, this is Melchizedek. Without father or mother or genealogy. Okay, he didn't have a genealogy of his mother or father listed. It says, without beginning of days, without beginning of days, or end of life. So we know this, we're not talking about um, uh, a, a, a regular man, okay? Because every man has a beginning and an ending, okay? He is without beginning of days or end of life. Like the son of Yah, and I, I wanted to show you the Hebrew roots version, but for whatever reason, this app is not opening up, so I had to use the Aberean um, Standard Bible. But it says, without beginning of days or end of life, like the son of Yah, he remains a priest for all time. Consider how great Melchizedek was. Even the patriarch Abraham, our forefather Abraham, gave him a tenth of the plunder of his spoils. Now the law, the Torah, commands the sons of Levi, because we know that the um, the Levites were given the charge of being priests, okay? Doing the orders of the services. Now the law commands the sons of Levi, who became priests, to collect a tenth from the people. That it is from their brethren, okay? From the Torah, from these other brethren, the 12 tribes, okay? From the other 11. From their brothers. Though they too are descended from Abraham. But Melchizedek, who did not trace his descendant from Levi. Okay, Melchizedek, his descendancy is not traced from the house of Levi, okay, not from this tribe, collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him and blessed him who had the promises. And indisputably, a le the lesser is blessed by the greater. So the inferior, okay, who was Abraham, was being blessed by the greater, Melchizedek, which scripture is showing you is our master. In the case of the Levites, mortal men collected the tenth. But in the case of Melchizedek, it is it is affirmed that he lives on. He lives forever. When you read other versions, it's eternal. Forever. He lives on. There is no beginning or end of days. It's just like the son of Yah. He remains a priest forever, for all times. And if you look at verse 9, it says, And so to speak, Levi, who collects the temp, okay, pay the temp through Abraham. Levi, again, who collects the temp, he paid the temp through Abraham. And pay close attention to what verse 10 says. For when Melchizedek met Abraham, when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi, Levi had not even been born yet, but look what it says in verse 10, Hebrews 7 and 10. It says, for when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the loins of his ancestor. He was still in the loins of his father. Loins. Look at the diagram that is on the screen. Loins. Look at this. I'm showing you a picture of what loins look like in the center. Now look at the picture on the right. The gentleman is showing you a picture of his loins. It's pointing, the arrow is pointing to the loins. The Bible confirms the Supreme Court decision 
And what we have read in Hebrews 7 and 10, the Apostle Shaw, the Apostle Shaul, Paul, look what I have here. Listen to what the Apostle Shaul, the Apostle Paul says about Levi's location. Before Levi was born, he tied it through Abraham. It says in Hebrews 7 and 10 says, for he, meaning Levi, was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. He was still in the loins of his father. We talked about this before. When we talked about the oneness, we talked about this before. When the Ruach revealed to me, the Supreme Court ruled that a fertilized egg embryo is a child. So they're not going to be able to freeze them. They are alive. And as the woman was saying in the video, oh, well, now what does that mean for all of the frozen embryos? What does this mean? Like they're, what's happening is they're being protected. The unborn are being shown that they have babies, that they are human, that they are babies. They are children. Even before they're born, even before they come forth from the womb, from the loins, I was reading this this morning in my during my quiet time. Hebrews 7 and 10. It says Levi was even though he collected the temp, it says that he was still in the loin of his ancestor, in the loins of Abraham, his father. In the in the scriptures it says the father of, the father of, he begat. Abraham had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons, and Levi was a son of your home, Jacob. And his ancestors, his forefathers, we, 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 we confirm, the chosen ones confirm that Abraham, Isaac, and, and your home, Jacob, he is our father too. Levi was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. He met him. Melchizedek in the scriptures we're looking at here is being shown. The, the high priest that is forever without a beginning and an end, eternal is Yahushua. He is the better, the better covenant. And I'm not going to get in the better priesthood. I'm not going to get off into that because I'm. that's not what this message is about. This message is to show you that the Bible confirms the Supreme Court's decision that an embryo is a child. Hallelujah. They're there. They're already there. You're, they're already there. They just haven't come forth. And so for those who are saying that a baby is not a child, it's not a lie, it's, you know, Father Yah is speaking. Those of you who are calling yourself Christians and believers and you're supporting abortion, you're supporting um, in vitro fertilization, you're supporting these things, a right to choose, repent. You need to repent. Save yourselves from this perverse generation to separate yourselves. The love of many waxing cold, lawlessness, lawlessness has a bound. And we're not talking about the laws of the land. We're talking about the literal teachings and instructions of the Father God. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Shalom.
Okay. My dear sis, you can come on in. Oh my goodness. I'm telling you, <laughs> this message was <gasps> off the chain, on point, <laughs> on fire. I mean, we'll drop the mic. <laughs> I'm telling you, hallelujah. 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 <laughs> yes. I want to start with the end before before right. we go. <laughs> you say you just got to. <laughs> Wherever you want to start, sis, just go Girl, ahead. I was like shouting, like, oh my goodness. Like it is right, you know, beyond he knew you before you were in your mother's womb. Like yeah. just take this to the next level. And, a next level. I'm telling you, sis, I am no, this is no lie. I was reading um, Psalms. Um, let me go to it. Mm -hmm. But this is on another thing. I was just reading about the, the good faith of, of, of the Messiah. Okay. As, as Psalms um, from David. And this is Psalms 110. Okay. And it, Speaks of his rule uh, and in in that lineage of becoming, you know, Melchizedek in the order that you know Yah promised that he will be a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, but just not on that order. But I was just telling you, I was reading, and then I went to literally Hebrews five, you know, just reading, and then I saw Hebrews seven, but I didn't make the connection. Like I didn't know like what this what this was you know what i'm saying like i knew the order of melchizedek not that but i'm saying as it relates to today seven right. like i was like i was when i read that i'm like okay yeah this was like i was just like blown away with knowing that loins you know what i'm saying uh, mm -hmm. uh, now that levi was in the loin because you know you read stuff but it's it's it, to you it's a you know why it's you, you have to and it's kind of like building yes you start with the foundation when he gives you a revelation of something new he gives you a foundation and then you're able and then any anytime the father yeah and this is what i'm saying anytime the father yeah gives me a new revelation and we, i know we're gonna go into the gentleness yeah but right. ever since you you taught that that's the reason why he kept telling me to give it to you Cause that's why I kept. Cause I was gonna do it, and it was like no. And the rule I kept saying no. Give it to Prina, and it was for a reason. Because I remember when we first were going over yeah. it, and I was like, and I kept saying it was related. Oh, was terrible, mm -hmm. and I'm like, what is that on me? And you, it wasn't for me because yeah. I probably wouldn't have put that in there. That message, I'm telling you, it has opened up. I keep it keeps opening up new yes, understanding yes. about who Yahushua is, yes. over and over of who he is, and the caution and being careful, and him saying that I am gentle. Take you know my yoke upon you. Learn of me. I am. I am a uh, gentle. I you know I'm lowly. I'm yes. humble, and. When I learned that gentle means secret. Yes. I was away it with that. That's out funny. of here. Wow. Gentle. Yes. Literally, the first definition, when you look it up in the ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible, I think it's 1009. I'm not sure. Yes, it is. The it very is. first definition <laughs> of secret, because I was going over the secret place. The okay. very first definition for secret was gentle. And it needs to be tamed, to be an ox that is tamed, one that is fit for good use. Yahushua said that he is gentle. He says, learn of me. Mm -hmm. It means to conceal, to guard. Mm -hmm. You guard with your eye. You, what did y'all say? To guard your eyes. He always yeah. told us to guard your eyes, to guard your ears, to watch. I will guide you with my eye. And that gentleness message, when we lay, when a foundation is laid, when he, I'm learning that when he brings me into certain revelations, it's a building block. It's a foundation that is setting me up to understand other scriptures that I have read over and over again. And it's now bringing new light. Like there's no end to his greatness. And absolutely. absolutely. Him. There's no 
like just the just searching. We will forever be seeking yes. and searching mm -hmm. for him and always continue to come into great wonders and knowledge of yeah. him. And I get super excited because it's been like, I've been learning different revelations, but they were kind of like random. And I'm like, okay, none of this stuff I can put together in the teaching. And it's like, it's almost like he's dropping nuggets and I'm saving it. Yeah. And then he builds it for something else later. And it's oh, what's happening is that gentleness message that you did was so important because it is open. It was literally opening up Yahusha. It's yeah. literally yeah. opening up mm -hmm. more understanding to scripture of things that we had up under a basic, you know, understanding uh, is now is adding on and it's being taken to the next level. Like this was, I'm telling you, this whole, I'm telling you, this this was the I yes. was, oh let's I don't even know how I didn't even know where it. to begin. Right. <laughs> But I'm telling you, when you started out, okay, before before we go to that, let me just say okay. this with the Supreme Court. Yes. I was just like over like blown away with Hebrews 7 and 10 as yes. you know, and and Genesis 14 and 7, 17 through 24. And when you got to the illustration of the loins and you know, just how it states that even before, like while he was in his father's loin, yeah. like that seal, like that seal. That's all. it. That's right there. It confirmed I was, it. Like, <laughs> I'm like, that's the icing on the cake. You know, yes. we all know all the scriptures of, you know, before you were in your mother's womb, you was knitting. Mm -hmm. I knew you. you know, yeah, like, I wanted you to be a proper year. This right here. Like this brought it to a deeper level and it just blew all of the premises or, or mindset of those as pro-life out the water right here. Pro, yeah, pro-choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pro -choice. Yeah, yeah, those pro who, yeah. Yes, yes, because it's literally is saying like he, when he knew Abraham, even though he was, Levi hadn't even... Levi hadn't even been born. He was still in the in the yeah. loins when he had met Abraham. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. said when he met when Melchizedek met Abraham, because notice everybody was searching who is Melchizedek. He it don't have no genealogy, no beginning or ending. He's it says he's eternal. It said that Melchizedek is not like mortal men. Yeah, he took the tie from Abraham. Abraham gave him a tie. He tied the tent to him. And he said when he met him, Levi, because we know that Levitical, Levitical priests were given a charge, yeah. take the mm -hmm. tithe. So it's saying Melchizedek accepted it, even though, you know, he says he is from, when you continue reading Hebrews yeah. chapter 7, it says that he's from the tribe of Yehuda, of Judah. Mm -hmm. When you keep reading that, I didn't put that on there. I just yeah. I was trying to make a point, but it says yeah. that he's from Judah, but he took the tithe and but he it stated that Levi, when he took it from Abraham, that Levi was still in the loins of his father. Yes. He was still there in the loins. Yes. He hadn't even been born yet because Abraham yes. had Isaac and Isaac had Jacob and then Jacob had the 12 sons. He wasn't like, this is far off. Yes. This Hallelujah. is far off and he's acknowledging him. And it's like, this, I was super excited, brought to tears yes. about Hallelujah. this Supreme Court. Hallelujah. Yeah. The yeah. Alabama, Alabama Supreme Court rules that embryos are children. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. They are children. Fertilized embryo are children. At the moment of the say because see that that whole thing when y'all in the beginning, y'all overturned Roe versus Wade. Many yes, people by yes, those he Christians and yes, people who went did. back out and voted again for mm -hmm. it to be turned back over. That that right there was for y'all to see who was for him and who was against him. Mm -hmm. Who was who was pro life mm -hmm. and who was not. That was for him to to basically separate the wheat from the chairs because Absolutely. those who were going out and said, "Well, a woman have the right to choose." No, you don't have the oh, right to choose anything no. because you are not the creator of heaven and earth. You do you did not give life 
and you don't have, we don't have the right to take a life. It is to the father. Yes. And it's for mm -hmm. him and he alone and mm -hmm. no one else. And when this was overturned, Roe versus Wade, everybody here in Michigan and all over the United States, many, many people voted for it to be turned back. And so now they're, you know, happy, the governor here, everybody's happy that they can now go and continue on doing what they're doing, saying that it's not, but the Alabama, and I'm, and we're just reporting, okay, um, what was said, the Alabama Supreme uh, Court yeah. ruled that embryos are, fertilized embryos are children, and so those who are doing IV, uh, in vitro fertilization, which is not of the father, yeah. Because you're trying to create outside of the womb that is that is coming from the enemy himself. Mm -hmm. Um, um, they over they they're now saying they're worried about what does this mean? If you're saying that those are children, because they can't they can't do what they've been doing. Yeah, yeah. children now they're not going to be able to freeze them and do all the this is life. And the father, yeah, was so, we're brought, well, I don't know if you noticed in that video, and I was so upset because as quickly as that tough showed on my wall, when you guys saw it, it just looked yeah. like it was fine. And it was a very hint. When I saw it, when I say that it was nothing but the tough. Wow. It is very distinct. I saw it like the, the smaller part it was I yeah it's yeah. this was nothing no blinds just nothing uh -huh. and as quickly as i went to get the camera and started to record it was dissipating that quickly and above that i don't know if you saw something above that that was above it that looked like it was circle it looked like the hebrew letter tet okay which is the ninth Hebrew letter of the Hebrew alphabet is the ninth letter. And the tet, it means basket. Yeah. It's a picture of a basket, it means to contain, to surround mud and clay. We know that man came from the ground. Yes. And we're, he says, I, yeah, he, it, we are the clay. Yeah. He shapes and he molds. And we come from the ground. When I looked at the vote, and it says the vote was seven to two, they voted seven to two. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that unborn, that the unborn mm -hmm. our children seven, was it, you know, seven, seven is a completion two. and nine, seven and two was nine. Nine has to do with the mud, the clay, mm -hmm. the dirt, yeah. the basket, the contained mm -hmm. to surround. So awesome, sis. I'm telling you, I was just blown away. You know, and even if you know, when you looked at the petri dish this of the sperm you saw yeah. it moving. that's life right there yeah yes it, it you know we have life in us the women's seed and the um you know the oh the the uh the eggs the egg and the, and the ovary yeah. one, come together to uh to to fertilize it it's or a me it's a it's a it's lie a media if y'all said okay y'all want to overturn Roe versus Wade so y'all okay we gonna I'm a I'm gonna scroll it all the way back we can right go to the womb now yes we can right go to the loins <laughs> <laughs> you can't go oh, back no further than the loins yeah can't go back further when I saw that mm -hmm. yesterday morning I had to add on the part two that's how we got this second okay okay because I okay. said there's no way I cannot. It came out like that revelation came right after this ruling and y'all showed me this. And I said, get out of here. Wow. So this even confirmed what I was saying before about when I was talking about the when I told you the to rock revealed me that they're already there. They yes. Just haven't been mm -hmm. I remember how we talked about yes. that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, the immovable tent just, oh my goodness, just going over you know are you connected to yahushua or not are you connected are you secure your your tent peg securely in solid ground and just going over like just what um the the vibe mean as far as nail peg and just including um you know, man, Adam, equal ground. Yeah, Adam, Adam out of earth. Yes. yes, I was just like, wow. And just going over steak again, you know what I'm saying? And just 
painting that picture that, you know, those that are securely anchored in Yahusha, you are not only going to be committed to following his way, just following the way, which he is the way, but you know, you're going to be obedience to Yah. You know what I'm saying? And, you're and directly connected to him. And, and directly if, connected. If, if, if you're anchor. 10, like that's mm -hmm. why it's the whole thing. It was the vibe, the, the why fastening yourselves to you. Yeah. Fasten yeah. means to bind. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so the question was, is your tent securely fastened? Yes. If Yahusha is over here and you over there, that, right? Then you're not fastened to him. You that's how how do you think we our people, our chosen people, how our forefathers became known as the lost tribe? How did they become lost? Yeah. Because they yeah. stopped following him. Absolutely. Before Absolutely. they were following his presence. They were following him at the yes. command of God, at the word. He is mm -hmm. the living word. They stopped following him. Mm -hmm. And that's how they became known as the lost tribe. They became lost because they stopped following him. But Yah and his, in his mercy and in his grace mm -hmm. sent his salvation, sent Yahusha. He said, I come not except for the lost sheep of the house of Yahshua. Okay. He came Hallelujah. for us. He yes. loves us so much. He sent his only begotten son to die for us so that we can be reconciled back Mm -hmm. And to renew that covenant because it's the church has not replaced his, his people. No, those no. 12 tribes, the gate, their names is on the gate in Revelation. So I don't absolutely. know where to get that from. Yeah, still, he, he is still taking them. They are the bride, but then there will be those who will be joined. Absolutely. And will be saved and be a part of the covenant and be a part of the house and the family of Yah. But he is renewing that 144,000 is the 12 tribes. Absolutely. Period. 12,000. And, and, and these are these 12 tribes. tribes that also follow the commandments. So the law is not done away with because if you also go back to Revelation, one of my other favorite scriptures, um, I, I believe is Revelation. I don't know if it's 22 or not, but blessed are those that keep the commandment for they have right to the tree of life. Of life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So like what, what law you, you know, you, you right. Yeah. He said he opens up the books. Yes. Plural. What is he doing? The books of remembrance where you're going to be judged right. by the things you did, but then it's also going to be another book. And mm -hmm. that other book is going to be what, like, what judge? Yeah. When you think about in our own earth, earthly realm, how can the judge throw the book at you, so to speak? How yes. can they judge and make a righteous judgment if there are no laws for them to abide by? They interpret what the law says, okay? So if you have broken the law, okay, um, the executive part of the executive branch would be your police officers and everything. If they say you've broken the law, then you have to go before the court of law, before a judge. And the judge, what is he, what books you think he opening up? What books is he making his decision from? Something that just came from the air or something that already exists and is binding? And would that be fair for a judge to throw the book at you or to throw you in jail and to sentence you and to punish you and you and and he's punished you from something that doesn't exist mm -hmm. absolutely Hallelujah. Husha did not set us free from the law absolutely. the teachings and instructions of yah he set us free when you read romans chapter 8 1 through 3 he set us free from the law of sin and, and death. death because the law of sin and death there's a covenant that's there, that embedded yeah. covenant with the flesh that mm -hmm. is enmity against the, the laws of Yah, the spirit of Yah. Paul in Romans 7 speaks of two laws. And so yeah. when you read Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, it tells us that in Yahushua, he has set us free mm -hmm. from the law of sin and death, not from his teachings and instructions. And I'm glad that you brought that up here because yeah. we have to be fastened to it. Absolutely. And I just love like now that you said that, because it brought me back to Jaleel, you know, yes. when you said that the nail. Oh, the like, oh, yeah. Judgment. And, and, you know, and when she drove that, 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 that nail peg with the hammer in, in the Caesarian King's hair as he slept, like, you know, judgment. It also represents. Yes. Judgment. And, yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. It's going to be judging. You know, he he's going to be judging from those books. So, yes, hallelujah. Yeah, when well, we were reading that he, Yahusha, that cornerstone, that, yes. that, that 10 yes, peg, exactly. I was like, what? 
and four out. Yes. yes. <laughs> I'm telling you, this was, I'm telling you, it was this, like, yes. I thought that first this was just gonna be a, just a little light message, but the, the more mm -hmm. I start putting this together, I'm like, mm -mm, this is this is gonna off be the it chart. Right here. Okay, and then <laughs> going into Moses and how, and it just showed how he prayed. You know, show me the, your way, and then yes. he said, no presence. It doesn't go with go with us. We ain't going. We ain't we not going. going. Isn't yeah. that what um Barack said to uh Deborah? Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you uh, if your presence, if you ain't going, I'm I'm not going. going. Yep. Yeah. And she was Absolutely. a woman. She said, You know yes. you're not gonna get the you know you're not gonna get the glory for this, right? Because a woman yes. mm -hmm. I was just like, this whole lesson was I'm telling you, and just showing, you know, that you know, cloud means watch, you know, and well, I, I, I yeah, I yeah, the eye I yeah. Yes. And I was just like, and I saw that when I was um putting gentleness together and I just, you know, that part. So that like kind of like reflected back when I yeah. was doing my research, but I didn't use it in there because, you know, at the time it was, it was dealing with what y'all wanted me to put in there. Yeah. But I'm telling you, just going back to uh, just tabernacle, the millennium reign with Yahusha, you know, tabernacling with Yah and Yahusha uh, in Isaiah 22, Zion, uh, mo uh, immovable tent. I was just yes, like... They will, yes, wasn't the yes. promise that glorious will be yes. secure. The tabernacle that's coming will be secure. When I, But I said, well, when we came back to the I said, I will guide you with my eye. It hey, literally yes, means yes. I will guide you with my cloud. Yes. I will continuously yes watch over yeah. you with my cloud that's why they were following the pillar of cloud by day and pillar i said yeah. you, yeah when he says i will guide you with my eye with my own eye he said i'm gonna guide you with my cloud and that's what they did they followed the cloud you should say, follow me and that's what we have to do today Absolutely. not follow after the world not following after what they're saying is right mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if they say you have the right. You you hear them chanting, we will not obey. Yes. We will not rebel this. They have unfastened themselves. Mm -hmm. They're not fastened. We cannot allow the world to be our barometer for what is right. We have to look to the scriptures. The word is the authority in our lives. And we have to follow him. We Absolutely. have to follow him. We have to obey. Because if you're not fasting, I pray that this message helped you because we're going to end this. I pray that this message helped you yes. to understand how important it is for us to obey and to follow Yahushua, to check ourselves and see if we're in the faith, to see if our tents, our houses, our yes. bodies, if we are fasting securely, mm -hmm. firmly fixed, rooted and grounded in the Mashiach, Taste and see that Yah is good, that he is good. Become familiar with him. Just like you become familiar with your favorite food or things that you want to try. Try him. You've tried everything else. Try him. Taste and see that he is good. Become familiar with him. Get in this secret place. Learn how to labor in the word, labor in prayer and fasting and spending time in the secret place. If we can spend two, three hours shopping at the mall, spend two hours eating food in a restaurant or spending time watching a movie. Why can't we do the same thing? Sitting in his presence, delighting ourselves in him. Tell him, look, Father, yeah, change my desires. Give me my heart's desires so and so that I may know you. And as Moses said, find grace in your sight. Absolutely. If we don't know him, he is not going to know us. Only Absolutely. way that you know someone is because you become familiar with them and you experience mm -hmm. them just like you do with food. And so if you have any- Yes, I'm going to say one thing, two things. Uh, yes. Well, one, uh, I, you know, just relating back to the chance of, you know, of the rebellion, they will not bay. It's just Joshua yes. 24 and 15 was perfect because it actually echoes, you know, and it seems evil to you to be to serve Yah, yeah, if it's to choose for yourself this day whom you will serve you know and i just want to end out i think this is a perfect scripture um because i read it last week early in the week and then y'all had me read it this morning so i, I I'm, I'm gonna read as 
as in um the remembrance of like Yahusha being that immovable tent and the promises and the faithfulness that Yah has given us his son, his only begotten son, Yah's salvation. I just want to read Psalms 110, if that's okay. Okay, with you. go ahead. Okay, so it says, and this is a Psalm of David. It says, Yah, Yah said to my master, sit at my right hand unto, um, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Yah extends your mighty scepter for Zion. Hallelujah. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy splendor from the womb of the dawn. To, to you belongs the dew of your youth. Yah has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Yah is at your right hand. He will crush kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge the nation heaping up the dead. He will crush the leaders far and wide. He will drink from the brooks by the rope by the road. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Hallelujah. 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 I just read that because I just started feeling led to start singing Psalm 67 and 4, the song of judgment again. Yes. I've been started, I've been led to start singing that again. And so Thank you, sis, for sharing. That was beautiful and on time. And so we pray that Yah will bless and keep you, that he makes his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you, and that he lifts up his counsel upon you and give you peace. Please leave your comments below. We want to know how this message bless you, what revelations you got. Understand, don't be afraid to... Um, to comment. We love interacting with you. If anyone has any questions, comments, or you still would like to support, you can email us at daughter of Yah tm at gmail.com which will be in the description below this video shalom
Before we advance, I want all of us to get into worship. If you are anywhere else in your soul, exit and enter into worship. Bow before your king in every way inside of your heart so that you can partake of what is on this table tonight. We will not stand as outsiders. We will not be looking in from the outside. Come in. Just ask God for help. Father Lord Almighty, take all of my attention. Take all of my heart. I worship you now. I lay all that I am before you now. I come in fully with everything that I am, with every question, with every answer, with every knowledge, with every truth. Worthy are you. Yeah. 